Does anyone else like tournament grand finals? Ho ho ho. Because that's what we got today. We have a match I played in the recent 16-man uh, pop-up tournament hosted by Turin. I posted up a group stage qualifier that I played earlier in the day and we managed to, to squeak out a victory with House Ekaz and now we've got House Ekaz here in the grand finals as well. This was a really really good game. Um, I think you guys are really gonna like it. Stick around and watch this one. This one is fun. So we, we've got, like I said, grand finalist lobby so we've got some, some veteran capable players here. We're gonna see some high-end play from most of them. Um, not me as much, but we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. It goes pretty well. Um, I'm dubbing over this actually because uh, at the time that I was playing, I was streaming this to Turin um, and I didn't want to cause my audio to cover the audio that I was streaming to him and then mess up his audio. It was a, it was a mess. Turin had, um, had us all streaming yeah, our, 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 our video feed via uh, an OBS application to him so he could jump between our different points of view. So if you get a chance, if you haven't seen that yet, you should go watch him. The, uh, unfortunately, the resolution is pretty bad that we're, that we're all streaming to him simultaneously, so it's hard to, to, to it's a little grainy, a little granular, but you've got it. We got yourself a, a high resolution first person view over here. But the, the whole game is really cool because you can see Turin jumps over to the Fremen, sees what they're doing, jumps over to the smugglers, sees what, sees what they're doing, jumping around because there's no actual, you know, there's no actual uh, uh, spectator slots in the game yet. So we do what we can, but here we go. We are going to spectate my very own game here. We've got a northern spawn with House Ekaz here. I think House Ekaz is really strong. Maybe yes, maybe the lady. best in the game currently. I don't know. I think it's arguable, but I think they are they are banging. So we've got the usual stuff. Not a lot to talk about really. We grab our spice field. We didn't see the uh, the minerals right away, so we, I was happy to run up and grab that imperial station up there. That's a perfectly acceptable early game grab. Money for knowledge. Quick, quick knowledge is a, is a nice payoff, gets you some developments faster, gets you pushed up along we that development track a little ahead of the pack, hopefully. So I see a couple of, uh, a couple of regions that do not have anything, any sort of special resources into them, so I am jumping down and just pillaging them right away, especially because they are within the range of my main base here. You can see that big, great big circle I've got shown up there. If they're in the range of the main base, the main base will shoot its missiles at it, making these fights very, very quick and easy for, uh, for clearing these villages out and getting some early pillages. Now, early pillages are a little dangerous, and it does kind of come back to bother me a bit, I think. Um, once you pillage something, at least with the ECAS and most factions who don't have special pillage stuff like Harkonnens or Smugglers, um, when you pillage something, it puts a timer on that land, making it cost double the authority to annex for the next, like, four months. So you could always feel free to pillage something if you can see into the future and know that you don't want that land for four more months. And that's sort of what I'm gambling on here. But for ECAS, because you're trying to build sanctuaries, it's a little risky to pillage too early. But I, I, I took the risk this game because I wanted the money. I wanted to keep, I wanted to keep a, as high a tempo as possible. I know we've got, uh, we've got savvy warlords in here that I need to be on my A game against. <clears throat> so I'm stepping over here. We're grabbing this. Uh, um, these minerals to the east of us, which is really great because it's a rare minerals, or not a rare minerals, but just a mineral spot for plus 100%. And it also has the uh, it also has the trait on the village that allows me to build an additional plascrete factory over there. So that'll we'll be raking in the plascrete and build into our heart's content just off of the back of that that one place there. I'm throwing up an early maintenance center in that middle region, since that middle region I can see is going to be attached to all these right away. And because I've got one plascrete already on the left here, and I'm going to make more plascrete on the right, those are high upkeep buildings, so that early maintenance center will help control that upkeep, keep it down for us. So the other players in this lobby were uh, Doghead on the Fremen. Uh, the Harkonnens, I think, were Vahuhol, something like that. I, I haven't played with him before, but he is, was, is obviously super savvy. And then Dirty Dan was on the Fremen. I believe the smugglers are to the west of us, the Harkonnens kind of on the sort of east, and uh, the Fremen down south. We have a pretty peaceful early game here. We we managed a fortuitous spawn for sure. All of our all of our enemies spawned a bit closer to each other and a bit further away from us. 
which we love as ECAs, right? ECAs have a real strong authority gain with uh, the, the creation of sanctuaries. And that fast authority gain allows you to really, once you get them set up, so you're a little slow at first, and then once you get them set up, it really sort of booms your authority gain, and you can, you can really grab a lot of territory, especially powering through the mid-game there. So we're not doing anything too crazy. We're grabbing, you know, the usual, the usual low-tier techs, taking a quick lay of the land to also up our uh, knowledge gain, and then we're grabbing the... Uh, Oh, I can't even think of the name of it, but the thing that lets us build the museum, because we really love the Museum of Unbound Arts as the special statecraft building in the ECAS main base. That allows you to build as many masterpieces of the same color as you want in a region. And that's going to be key to us here, because we're going to use that to boom our economy. So part of... Uh, <clears throat> Part of the uh, the ECAS plan here, part of what makes the land I spawned on back here so good, is as we expand, we're going to see that I managed to secure not three, not four, but five whole spice fields. Oh, it's the dream spawn. Five spice fields is certainly more than my fair share, and uh, we're gonna we're gonna combo those five spice fields by building a ton of economic masterpieces on them, and. Because economic masterpieces count as two economic buildings each, and then we're going to get the Harvester Works district in our main base. And the Harvester Works district says for each economic building on a spice field, that harvester works five percent faster. So if we've got one refinery and four economic masterpieces, our harvesters are kicking out an additional forty-five percent of the spice, which is really quite good. So we're going to be we're going to be the spice lord this game. We've got ourselves Sanya and Ibo Vip as our, our counselors. So right now you can see Ibo gives me the ability to apply immunity to things. Now something people don't always realize is Ibo gives you immunity to bad things, but he also allows you to um, apply immunity to good things too. So if you use immunity to good things, it means you gracefully withdraw from it, right? So I did some of that here. I said I didn't. I don't care about water subsidies, so I gracefully withdrew from it. And by withdrawing, it pays me out an instant uh, plus ten influence. So you know, if it's something that I don't particularly care about, or uh, you know, it's I, I don't think I don't I don't think I'm going to get it. I can withdraw from it and get like a little payout for it. And then if I want to actually do the immunity to avoid some bad stuff, which can be critically important. Um, that costs me 20 lands red standing, which I'm trying to avoid because I can also see that I am the most likely the uh, political rivals. player in this lobby. Smugglers can generate a lot of influence, but it takes them a long time to do so. They're not normally a political threat. Harkonnens typically don't go too hard into the politics, and the Fremen, of course, you know, don't ever get any votes. They are not really a political threat. They can, under some circumstances, generate a decent authority or even maybe threaten Gov with unique mechanics, but for the most part, they don't pump out influence. They don't vie for charters and look for a governorship win. That would be pretty rare and unusual. But the ECAS absolutely do. So that is in my back pocket here as a simultaneous second or third uh, win condition that I've got in my mind. So I'm just expanding. I'm taking land. Um, I'm tr I don't have a great opportunity to uh, look for uh, early sanctuaries. I'm I'm spoiled by too many too many good uh, provinces around, so I'm trying to figure out what do I take and what do I not take. So one thing I end up doing is I end up leaving uh, Sandfall, which is normally a very good province, I end up opting to leave it uncaptured. So why do that? Um, you do it because I wanted the extra authority. You can always go back and capture it later if you want to, but uh, by having a, you know, sanctuaries, having them in your back pocket, especially special sanctuaries, typically you sort of save them and then at the end of the game when things are real tight, you'd go back and you'd capture them uh, because that's a, then a, suddenly a big boost of, of hegemony that other people maybe weren't planning on, on you taking. And because the stuff that you keep in your back pocket like that tend to be fairly close to your base, they, they're usually uh, relatively cheap on authority to grab too. So that's my plan here. I'm going to take actually both of these special regions that are just north of me. I'm going to turn into sanctuaries and I'm going to hang on to them. And when I really need to, I'm going to uh, uh, try to ha have them available to capture to, to spike my hegemony.
So we are looking around, like I said, doing a lot of reading of traits and, and, and trying to figure out what my expansion looks like here. And then just grabbing as much as I possibly can within, you know, within my authority here. So we are, I think we're going to go up and, and pillage Sandfall here shortly. Since it, since I've sort of determined already that I'm not going to take it, I'm going to walk up and pillage it, which is, you know, it's, I, I, I don't need to, I don't need to annex it anytime soon with authority so I can safely pillage it and pull some money out of it. Received. I got an early Ix scientist here, so I am taking my uh, my lab thopter and pathing it around the map. We get a tr we get a trade offer from from uh, Vahutol, and he wants money. And I said, uh, no, he didn't. He wanted research agreement, which I said, okay. Normally, the Baron wants money from you, and you always say no to the Baron when he asks for a money trade. Because Barons, with their oppression mechanics, are typically going to be able to squeeze out more money from a trade agreement than you are. And, you know, you don't want to be giving away trades that are more favorable to the other person than they are to you. It's okay if it's one-to-one, -one, but, you know, if they're going to they're gonna be able to, to squeeze more out of it than you, then you are giving up some strengths to them. So we are, we're also very low on water, so I've got to, got to keep a, a close eye here. I think maybe I lose a guy? I don't know, it was very close. I do manage to get it, and I can, I can get back out again. But uh, I, I skate super greedy this whole whole early early mid and, and late game um, because I know people have not spawned very close to me I am not investing in the early manpower buildings and not maintaining a large military because I'm figuring people are gonna be busy I am not in I don't have a lot of good options for uh, for wind to turn it into water so that's also not uh, not a good you know, though we're going to be crazy rich on money, water is going to be super tight. So it's going to be hard to, we got to be really careful uh, moving around so that our guys don't die of dehydration move, moving from spot to spot. As usual, we grab the quick guys on Arrakis because we want the extra authority whenever possible. We're keeping a close eye on all of the various, um, all the various points of interest that pop up around us. We've got pretty lucky, some good tech ones. We've got a couple authority ones. So I just grabbed the authority water one to, uh, pop up, boost up my authority to come grab this uh, other uh, other mineral region up top that will make my first sanctuary and sort of uh, prime that terrain for some some, some capturing. Ready for the hunt. We'll shoot them full of lead. I think we actually lose a guy here. Yeah, so we ended up get, sloppily, we allowed some aggro onto our ranged troops, which weakened them enough that uh, once the water runs out, they're the first to die. I think if I had done been a little more careful to bounce that around, I think we could have kept everyone alive, but uh, the, the water ran out quicker than I expected. We've only got 11. 11 is definitely danger zone. You feel a lot better with like 20 water if you're expanding, or more than, more than 10 for sure. 10 below is... Like I said, danger zone. You guys are probably gonna die of thirst, or just barely not die of thirst after their uh, attack and all kinds of militias. So we're getting some better, uh, we're getting some better scouting done. We're starting to see more of the wild, the the wider world, and we can see that the barons have has sort of aggressively expanded mid, and is also kind of pushing south towards the Fremen. Meanwhile, I can't see it here, but I did see in Turin's game that the smugglers also are pushing south towards the Fremen. So I, even unbeknownst to me at this time, am just in a fantastic spot. I've, I've got a lot of territory to expand in. I've got no pressure to force me to be less greedy. So I am greeting to my heart's content. And though I'm not making a lot right now, what I'm doing is I am setting the, uh, I'm setting the foundation for it. So here I actually, I suspect that this uh, Trial of the Great Houses is going to pass, so I opt to spend 20 lands red standing to make myself immune to it. But then I also sort of realized that I, I, I want to try to get other stuff if at all possible. I, I thought the Fremen would, would vote into this, and they don't. So I ended up uh, opting out of this for 20 lands red standing, and then it doesn't pass, so I just gave up 20 lands red standing for nothing. Feels bad, but I, I really thought that, uh, I thought the Fremen would lean into it.
just waiting on votes to be tabulated, see what comes up. I ended up trying to grab the missionaries, but I got screwed over by the minor houses on it. Or maybe he just had a few more votes there, I didn't quite see. But the I was really frustrated the lands where I didn't pass. It would have been nice because it would have put the smugglers and the Harkonnens straight into the pits down to poor lands where I had standing, which is sort of what I was hoping for. But uh, no such luck. That's all right. The, the votes don't always go the way you want them to, even when you think you've got the votes to, to manage it. We also run pretty lean on uh, our militia throughout the Empire for basically most of the game. Okay, you can see at this point I'm starting to get, uh, I got my museum completed and my main base, so I am throwing up the economic masterpieces in every, uh, in every spice field, in every place that it's going to be relevant to. Masterpieces, whenever you can get them to match, you know, certain village traits, they are always a good, good investment. So I'm going up here, I'm getting ready to cap that other spice field at the same time. Back around my base, I can pillage those villages again that are within my missile field. And I see those raiders coming out, so I got to, I spotted right where they popped out of, and I can get, uh, I can get a scan right on top of them right away. I think I man I caught both of these sieges with the old eyeballs and managed to get scans on them to identify them. That's a really important way to find out where the sieges are on the map, you know. Anytime your, your spider sense starts tingling, or maybe you need to work on your spider sense and be, be looking for them. When you zoom out, you look on the map for where those black raiders are going to pop out. And if you, or if you see them, if you didn't see them pop out right away, you see them and you kind of extrapolate backwards where they came from. And then you can use your probe scans to find those sieges. Which is important, right? Sometimes they can have uh, real valuable trades that you can make with them. Sometimes they have real valuable alliances yes, that you're going to want to plan for. And uh, they they also, just by trading with them, you up your your sort of relationships, relationship standing with them. And I, th I don't know the exact point, but it's something like maybe 50 or 60, somewhere around that range. Once they become a little more friendly to you, they stop sending raiding parties to you and are more like become more likely to send raiding parties to your enemies and stuff, which is really nice because the raids can be pretty strong, especially in this current patch here. So we, we've got some friendly sieges up there, though I will say in this game, sieges are really dangerous if there's a Fremen around because the Fremen can always rally to them. Though, uh, I saw earlier when I watched, you know, the Turin's point of view, when he looks over at Dirty Dan and the Fremen, Dirty Dan did not opt for Stilgar, who I think is pretty meta these days. I would recommend taking a Stilgar if you were going to play some Fremen. Dirty Dan did not take Stilgar, so he did not get that free vision of every siege on the map. Um, and I don't think he ever... I don't think he ever discovers that those sieges up there... Um, you know, obviously uh, as far away from him as they could possibly be. Uh, so those do not end up being a liability for us, but they easily could um, had the Fremen been a bit closer and or had a Stilgar and been able to utilize them. See, just so dangerous because the Fremen can rally straight to them because the Fremen can call sort of neutral reinforcements out of them with a certain development. All that kind of stuff. Usually, if there's a Fremen of the game, I recommend you, you try to burn down whatever sieges you possibly can once you get the military to do so. So, we've got our troops a little bit split up here. Oh, we've got a random scavenger drone from Doghead up here. I think he was grabbing points of interest, and just as my musketeer was trying to grab points of interest, and the trouble with the scavenger drone, at least the trouble for me, is that they don't take any supplies, so he can happily chase my poor musketeer all the way down, which he does. Dirty dog head. You honor us. I sent a squire to chase him off, but it's no, no big deal. One musketeer down, but I mean, dog head is like three or four regions away, so I'm, I'm not taking that as proper aggression yet. That's just, just the way it, just the way it is. I think he was out grabbing points of interest. So we are now starting. So we're just about to. Uh, finish scouting that eastern right, spice. So I see this western spice over here, so I'm plotting to go take that other western spice to put me up to four spice fields. I'm feeling great, and I just now finished scouting the eastern spice field as well. Look, there's another one, two regions to the east. They're closer to me than they are to anyone else. Oh my goodness, I'm going to have five spice fields in a grand finals game. It's going to be glorious, ladies and gentlemen. 
We are still hurting on the uh, the tightness of manpower, and our money is razor thin currently. We haven't quite been able to, to, to pop off with our economic plan. That's coming later. Like I said, we're laying the groundwork for stuff. We're making sure we've got our masterpieces out. I don't even know if I have my harvester works up yet, but it's certainly on my mind. Uh, and the, the the real problem is right now an embarrassment of riches. I've got all this stuff I want. What do I take first? Where do I go? What you know? What makes the most sense? There's a space cruiser down south towards the middle of the map, which I would really like, but uh, I, I opt to go for these spice fields first to make sure that uh, we secure a, a, a banging economy here this game. And I think someone else beats me to that space cruiser down below, which is a little sad, but not the end of the world. I think I would rather have a spice field than the space wreck. <clears throat> There's plenty of ways to get some guild favor. We'll get there eventually, though I don't know if I, I'm trying to think, I don't know if I ever actually get there this game. The game, um, it, let me tell you, it becomes a bit bombastic a little later on and things get hurried and uh, we'll see. We'll keep an eye on it, see if I ever actually get to guild, get my guild favor up. But the rates are, the, the, the Choman rates are pretty bad, 1.8 is, is, is lousy. I recommend that you are stockpiling if it's 1.8, which I am trying to do here, so I am broke as a joke. I got a lot of I got a lot of spice stockpiled, and we got a lot more coming in. We're making 116 at the moment, and a lot more to come. But uh, right now, it's not paying us out, so we are very poor. We're running on razor thin margins. Even so, I opt to, to pull out a couple more military, and I'm kind of keeping, um, for the most part, I'm trying to keep like two forces: one force that can kind of bounce around and pillage stuff that I want pillaged, uh, and another force that could go out and be annexing stuff. And uh, the pillage force is also tasked on going to explore those points of interest whenever we find good ones around. So we got another Landsrad pops up. Nothing uh, stands out to me here. Um, I opt out of the territory contest because I don't have any special regions. I'm, all, all the special regions that are by me, I'm put, making into sanctuaries. I opt out of the Chome subsidies because I don't care about that, and that's some free influence. And then I'm actually happy to pass the Landsrad examination. Um, the Harkonnens got above me in uh, Landsrad standing here, which I guess I didn't realize at the time. But I'm happy to, to dump it a little much uh, because I expect to, to, to get a better, a better payback. Gain 100% Landsrad standing until the start of the next council will be good. Um, I'm going to have my blue buildings up. I'm going to have... Uh, I'm gonna, I think I try to make peace deals with people in between here. Not not a particularly impactful one. So I take a look here. I'm making 10 a council. The Harkonnens are making 20 a council. I so I immediately see if Doghead wants some peace. I think about a research agreement, but I think after, I, I opt actually just to give him peace and not a research agreement. Let's get to Because I don't like you, Doghead. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, so a second, uh, a second alliance there, or non-aggression pack there, will help boost up my uh, my lands red standing even more for the next council which is what we're we looking for we're looking for a little a little more than the usual the, the average bear of lands red because we want to be able to push some council charters and stuff later on before other people can so there we go we've got spice field number four up these um i think i'm trying to think back both of those one of those uh sieges was an alliance for better spy or faster and cheaper spying operations which I opted not to get for and the other alliance was something like 10% uh, more uh, production in all your building in your villages or something which is a great one right I opt to do that as soon as we end up uh, getting getting that alliance up so I go down and I grab out this uh, fuel cell region down below there as well. The fuel cells we don't care about early on, not particularly at least. You know, a war banner or two is nice these days. In the olden days, the ECAs were very dependent on their war banners for their military strength, but now they're just kind of nice to have. But we're grabbing up that space both for the fuel cells and also because it will turn that second special region into a sanctuary for us. And the more sanctuaries, the better. We've got Sanya, who is paying us out money for our sanctuaries. We've got. Uh, uh, we've got, um, you know, and then the sanctuaries just give us the extra authority so that we can even we can even speed up our our expansion even more. You can see my guys are still thirsty, very very thirsty. And we got to deal with some some raiders coming out of these. We haven't quite convinced the locals that uh, we're our friends yet. Baron tries to get a, a trade treaty for money. I probably should have taken it actually. Um, 
the Baron does not end up as an economic powerhouse, and I do. So if I had some some extra economic treaties thrown out and about, I would have I would have sort of popped off even more as far as the economy goes. But you can see I just go straight into the the yellow masterpieces up there, and we opt for I'm thinking I'm thinking I'm checking people out. We opt for an early research center. So the plan with the research center is it'll give me that it'll give me that extra boost into knowledge gain uh, through the early game. It'll give me extra boosts in hegemony. Um, you've probably seen before that if you build a research center, it boosts the hegemony you gain from all of your regions that you control uh, retroactively by 15%. So if you've got 10,000 hegemony from regions, uh, as soon as you build that research center, it's going to pay you out 15%. It will award you, you know, 1,500 more hedge. But, you know, the other benefit from it is once it's built, so not retroactively, it'll also give you that extra 15% on stuff like your spice taxes or like special uh, lands red resolutions that come up. Um, if you are getting um, anything from craft workshops, it would increase that. So I opt into that early on. So, one, because I ex I know I'm not taking any special regions, so by having it early on, I'm basically grabbing it to up the value I'm getting out of paying my spice taxes. And uh, the danger with it is that it makes you look like more of a target. It kind of artificially inflates your hegemony a little more than it would otherwise be. But I see I'm, I'm low. I'm at 7k. Everybody else is at 8 or 9k. And again, because I haven't grabbed any special regions, I'm turning mine into sanctuaries, so I'm kind of sandbagging. I'm kind of hanging back behind the pack. <laughs> Believe it or not, this is the game when I'm trying to appear unthreatening. Uh, that'll be funny later on. <clears throat> but we're feeling good. We are rocking our four spice fields. We've gone into crew training and chome support heavily, greedily into the deep economic tech, and now I'm coming back and I'm grabbing uh, the military tech. As I start to see some smugglers on the borders, I realize these western villages are very exposed, totally ripe for some smuggler raiding, um, obviously some lo local, local Fremen raiding as well. So I gotta split up the troops, half of them go back to take care of those raiders, and half of them head east to try to lay claim to that fifth spice field. Ho ho ho. But then I realized actually that those raiders, they must have been friends with me because they are not going to attack me. They're going for a walk to go attack the smugglers. The, the, the benefits of trade. And we are keeping a close eye on our chome rate. We're about to spend our tax here and we're going to see what the value of the next one is. 2.0, uh, ever so slightly better. Not great. It's a very average rate. It's, it's actually it's a, quite a below average rate still, seeing as how I've paid my spice tax three times. So I'm gaining a 0.3 on it. So it's really more like a 1.7, which is lousy, but I'm about to max out my stockpile anyways, so we're trading a little more. So we're taking the long walk down south. We are going to go and get spice field number five. We've got, uh, we've got a couple operations ready. We've got the supplies just in case we overextend. We've got the epic quest just in case we end up in a fight somewhere. And I'm, again, I keep opening up this faction view because I want to keep a close eye if anyone is buying uh, chome shares. I want to keep a close eye if people get that sort of green plus next to their hegemony if they are making their craft workshops or getting other sort of daily hedge bonuses. I want to be able to monitor that. I want to. I want to see it from a very early time, rather than you know. I'm not, I don't. You don't, you don't want to end up surprised by that. Why does this guy have five thousand more heads than I thought he would? That's that's no good. And though the water is still very, very, very tight, we managed to keep everyone alive and take that to take that land. Down to nine water here. Like I said, we're operating on razor thin margins, but you can see the economy is starting to pay off now. We're up to making 223 spice a day. We are selling a bunch of that and pulling in 273 solari, so we are starting to feel good on the economy. And we can see the Baron is still not really coming north, so the smugglers ended up taking the space wreck below us that we wanted. Um, that would have been a natural point of friction, but uh, it doesn't end up being because I've got so much space that other space that I, I still want to expand to, so it's no big deal. We're checking out here. I'm trying to figure out what I want, what I might want to step out of. I don't need the guards, so I withdraw from the guards for an extra 10 influence. Then, 
the Harkonnens put their taint on the authority, if I recall right here, and I, I think I opt for it anyways. Let's see, I'm waiting for the time to tick down. I kinda went, no, do I, do I vote for Harkonnens? What am I doing here? Yeah, okay, I guess I did. I must be thinking of a different one. Ah, oh, the, the, the Ikaz, or the smugglers, try to put the spice on me. I think what it was is, um, as I'm thinking through it, I realized how much spice I'm actually making. And I don't know if the lobby has realized it yet. Doghead maybe was. Maybe he sees the spice fields I've got. He probably does. He's, I see a bunch of thorn ornithopters flying over my lands here. So I, I really, even though I wanted the authority to power that, uh, that expansion even more, I wanted to not get, uh... I wanted to not get that the dirty spice on me. Course, um, the minus one We're rate is up. not always, you know, sometimes it's not bad at all. Sometimes you get it on you, and if you've got enough bank, you just stockpile all of your spice, and it's no big deal. But in this case, I was actually ha already had so much spice stockpiled that uh, it would have been annoying because I would have hit my stockpile max and been forced to sell into that crappy rate anyways. So that's why I opted to throw those extra votes and influence just to try to get it somewhere else. And I was always, I'm always sort of concerned about a, a Choman Baron, so uh, when in doubt, put it on the Baron. Though when in doubt, put it on the Fremen too. The Fremen usually run pretty wide on, on their old their spice harvesting teams. So we are, so we've got our harvester works up for sure. We are starting to fill out our, all harvesters with crew. And uh, I am looking to expand even further southward. On There's watch. the, it's, it's some, it's some yes, interesting, buddy. some tight terrain. So down below us, there yes, sir, is the desolation. Lady. So if I can take this one little spot right in front of me there, then it blocks off the right into yet another sanctuary. Making, making the, the sanctuary game feel strong here. We're getting our agents up. Everything's going well. And again, we are just, What's we are deeply greeting here, right? Our manpower is very low. We are in... We're near the end of month three, and we're, we're, we haven't capped out military yet, which is very dangerous, right? If someone with a capped out military attacks me, I don't have any, I don't have the bank to build up troops, and I don't have the army to hold them back necessarily, so I would have to yield whatever they, whatever they would try and take from me. But we're fine, because uh, the, the benefits of the map seed uh, have, our, have our enemies all touching tips down there, all all entangled with one another. They are all neighbors. I don't have a single neighbor yet. None of my territory is touching anybody else's territory, right? <laughs> I sort of wish it was at this point, so I could I could put up some listing posts and, and get a better uh, influence income, but it's not. We actually, we end up with a couple of guys get worm struck here that I sent up to fight uh, those raiders. So I fall even further behind an army. My army is down to 21, leaving me really extremely vulnerable. Um, but we are still building the blues, and we're building the yellows in our main base. Oh, now now we now we start we transition. We go. My typical build would be the three red and the three blue for uh, Ecaz. It's really it's really one of their best. One of the best things about Ecaz is the double threat. You know, they can they might push and win the game with hegemony thanks to the champions. So you can see we took Whitmore Blood as our hero. Whitmore is awesome. He is a champion, and he allows you to name an additional other champion in addition to in addition to the one champion you could already name for three champions. And what's champion? Champions are. Uh, units that ha get maxed out uh, yes, experience levels, so they get extra stats from that. They get bonus stats just from being champions. Whitmore then uh, says for every trophy they take, they even get more hit points, so it boosts up their stats even more. And critically, the trophies, which is if a champion's in a fight with someone and that someone dies, not a militia, but another player's units, uh, the champion pays out 100 hedge. And that stacks for each champion. So game, if right? you've got three champions in a fight and you kill ten guys, each champion just got a thousand hegemony in trophies. And that's gonna be uh, that's gonna be an important thing to keep an eye on later game here. I actually I sort of under uh, Though I've done this many times, I sort of underappreciate how much hedge uh, my champions are about to farm here. Whitmore's awesome. I think Alessa, the uh, the other uh, the other Ikaz hero, is plenty viable, but Whitmore is just so freaking good. 
I can't live without him. He's great. He really enables that uh, that dangerous hedge play where, you know, the Ekaz are able to spike their hegemony faster than anyone else because they could just walk out and, and chop up a militia. They could beat an enemy army and just get a huge amount of hedge that no one else had really been planning or expecting up to that moment, right? So I'm looking down at the Baron's lands, and he has, it's very interesting, he's been expanding in a very unique way down there. He doesn't really have sort of a contiguous empire, he's sort of picking and choosing a little stuff here, a little stuff there, which likely means he's saving those in-between regions so he can just do his, uh, his parade of pillaging, you know. The, the the Harkonnens especially get lots of benefits yes, from pillaging. Already. It makes their regions even more ch even cheaper to grab with uh, authority. Our lives are yours. So I am starting to eyeball down there and say, well, you know, what if what if I took those regions for myself? What's he gonna do about it? Is he gonna come fight me? Uh, spoilers, he does. But we'll see it when we get there. But yeah, my my What's greed is showing here. So, uh, my I mean, we're making 13 authority a day, which is a very good authority income. But we're still pretty light on the manpower, and so I opt to finish out my embassy now to get my three blue up, and then we'll go back into finishing out our reds after that. We're checking out. So okay, it's minus 20 building upkeep for all of our buildings thanks to this uh, siege alliance. It's amazing. We're absolutely going to take that deal. Um, we, we're paying out a huge... I mean, buildings are a huge amount of upkeep that you pay daily in Solari for your empire. So minus 20% is a, a, a massive economic boon. So we take a little break. I shout out to chat. Funny enough, I think in the turn stream, they're actually... Um, they're doing... Uh, like a vote or a poll to see who they think is going to win right as I start shouting out to them. So um, I think I think I managed to win that poll. I think we've got the fans cheering for us here. I could feel it in my bones. I'm feeling good. Uh, we're getting everything we want so far, right? And as long as no one messes with us in the real short term here, where we're still in kind of a still in kind of a window of, of dangerous greed, right? Our manpower income is not high enough and our army is not large enough. <clears throat> we don't, you know, we haven't even been able to fill out our harvesters. We haven't even been able to fill out our bases. Most of our bases have like a single heavy militia, just a sort of a, a token militia force here. But one of the nice things about taking a, a pause for everyone to go pee, especially if you're not one of the ones that has to go pee, is you can uh, you can do a little bit of a, a little bit of macro back at the base. Make sure things are building, check on things, see if you need to grab stuff, look around. It's nice being able to interact with the map while it's paused. It's a nice, it's a, it's a buff for sure. I got a little, I got a little more game time in than everybody else did because they all, they all walked away. <clears throat> it starts right back up here, so not a big pause, no big deal. And we are gonna continue the greed, but now we're starting, we're starting to eyeball towards uh, what's it gonna look when we when we're done with the greed and so non greed was would be uh, we we make sure we've got uh, we make sure we've got as many recruitment offices spread around as possible we make sure we've got uh, a, a maxed out army that's ready to go as well as a bank of manpower that we can use to replace it and we gotta we gotta fill out our harvesters because that's still key to our our long term plans here. I'm checking everyone's chome and hedge. I am still way down in hedge, and I am—I have no chome at all yet, so I don't look like a threat to anyone. Uh, most of the lobby, I think, is starting to to uh, to understand that no one's been messing with the ecas this whole time. And uh, this is a good one here. So the barons fell a little bit behind in uh, lands red standing. I managed to get ahead of them here, and. Uh, I managed to also secure this extra 30 Landsrad for myself. Now, meanwhile, the smugglers are in the pits. The Fremen are not even making <laughs> any influence at all. So this is really where we can we start to pull away from the pack here. Uh, leaning into some political ambitions. Uh, we just paid our tax and the chome rate is bad again, so we are still maintaining that large stockpile. We got our chome branch up in our main base, so that increases our stockpile size up to 6,000. And what we're really hoping for, so the chome branch gives you that plus 0.8 uh, trade rate if it's uh, 2.2 2 
2.2 or 2.3 or higher as a base rate. And the chome can fluctuate, your chome rates fluctuate anything from like 1.5 to 2.5. So right now it's actually a 1.6, which is an awful rate. So I am still stockpiling up to max, but uh, I'm about I'm about to hit my the maximum stockpile. We're up to 301 spice a day, which is pretty solid. We're just waiting and hoping and praying for a good rate to turn on this turn up turn open the hose and and flood the market with spice for massive money. So I'm sort of joking with people. I'm telling them I'm going chome. That's why I'm up to 0.45 percent of chome shares. Don't tell them sneakily I am actually going for some chome here. Just not yet. It's it's not a it's not a tempo chome. It's sort of a a, a, high, a hidden waiting in the wings kind of chome play. So I am popping around, and it occurs to me that assassins are a thing. So I start pulling agents out of uh, non-critical spaces and getting them on counterintelligence. The last thing I need is to be sitting on a glorious five spice kingdom and have some assassins kill me. Ugh. Ooh, I shiver just thinking about it. We got the big game right but uh, we're starting we're starting to invest in the... We've gotten some red tech, so we're starting to invest in the perfected military units as well. Another benefit of not having that early aggression is um, once you get... I think it's the I think it's the second tech on the... Or maybe the first tech in the third column of red stuff allows the ECAS to make perfected units, right? That's... Um, your units will take 100% more time to train, and they will cost 50% more, but they come out with like 20% more health or power, or something like that. It's a, it's a, it's a nice stat boost for in, in return for a higher cost and a much longer train time. But if you don't have the pressure on you, you can invest in that kind of stuff, right? Uh, you can look at them. They're ticking up so slow. The perfected stuff takes forever to train. It's probably... A base, a base train rate is maybe like five-ish days, and then perfected ones are probably then ten, ten or more days, something like that. Yeah, it's like, like you get a couple guys a month maybe if you're making perfected ones. But if you don't got the pressure on you, you can opt for those long-term strategies, right? They're gonna, they're gonna pay out dividends once the, once the knives clash in the battlefield. Keeping an eye on the Baron down there. So it looks like he's he's starting to actually annex the stuff that I wanted, which makes me sad. Though I believe he actually backs off and cancels one of those and pillages it instead. Giving us still that opportunity for a little bit of a uh, little bit of cheeky expansion down there in the uh, the, the not too, too distant future. So I am looking around, I am trying to figure out what my current plans are. So I grabbed that little space that we had been pillaging. I probably paid a little bit extra because I ended up grabbing it before I expected to. And you can see we're being forced into selling our, out of our stockpile now. Um, we've maxed out at 6,000, so all of our extra is getting sold at that really lousy rate. But even at that lousy rate, it's plus 500 Solari. And it does get called out on the map that two of my sanctuaries are special regions, right? We got savvy players, they're keeping an eye on the map here. Service, you know, knowing that ECAS has special regions as sanctuaries is a big deal, right? It's the difference of uh, a bonus thousand plus uh, hegemony that could be boomed later on. I tell them to mind their own business. <laughs> Um, so I'm going around, I'm making sure uh, our spice harvesters are on safe mode, and I, we are saucing them up with, uh, with the extra crew. <clears throat> Keeping a close eye on that faction screen again. Nobody's grabbing extra chome, and the rate of uh, hegemony has slowed down a bit. And I see that I'm maxed out on um, my stockpile of spice, and the rate is lousy, so I actually switch in my spacing guild over to sending the spacing guild spice instead of influence, right? We, got the big we are rivals. putting up a military base on the east side since that's, I figure, the most likely t space uh, area for some conflict because I kind of want to fight the Harkonnens. The Harkonnens are generally a pretty good matchup for the Ekaz. The Harkonnens like to sort of run in and just kind of man fight you, like uh, without a whole lot of micro. And the Ekaz kind of just like to stand there and man fight you too. Uh, they like to let their knights do the heavy work and just cleave through things without worrying about stuff. The smugglers are a worse matchup. Um, 
I think the ECAS still beat the smugglers pretty handily, but uh, the, the nature of the large groups of snipers means they're likely to be able to pick off your important units, your champions, maybe your hero, maybe your knights for sure. They could just focus fire them down with their snipers, and eventually you'll catch them and you'll tear them to pieces, but you'll have, you'll have bad casualties. So I am uh, cautious about engaging the, the smugglers at all, because um, I, I want to be able to, to build up the strength of my champions by harvesting some trophies. I want to be able to build up my hedge that way as well. So we opt for uh, aggressing yours. upon our Harkonnen neighbors, and not quite yet, because we, we need more time still. We're still, but we're still building the perfected troops up. We're still spending every ounce of manpower we pull in. We've invested a little bit more, so we're up to plus 21, and uh, we're starting to buy Chome shares as well. Like I said, even though the rate is garbage, we've hit the max of our stockpile, so we don't got a lot of, a lot of other options to work with. And we got another lands rad coming up to think about. And I'd realize actually that this region right below me um, would have been a nice grab earlier. It's got the recruitment office bonus allowing me to build, you know, plus one recruitment office and plus 20% manpower. And then because it's next to a, a sanctuary, I can build even an additional one. So we end up with three recruitment offices down there that all get plus 20% to their output and really helps to ease my manpower problems uh, once they get online. Pretty boring lands red here. Nothing of any excitement whatsoever. I don't even remember this one. So <laughs> all factions suffer economy development speed. I've got all the economy tech I want. So we want to make it lousy if anybody else actually wants some. And then otherwise, we're fine to just sort of toss a couple votes here or there. No big deal. None of that matters to us. We are checking stuff out, and we're opting to, to move our tech path down to the political art one. Uh, you don't need it early on, but eventually you're going to want it as the ECAS, because the political art is the development that says uh, charters that you hold cannot be put up for, uh, for, for vote again, right? And I'm actually, I'm going through my empire right now, I'm seeing that my... My Plazcrete is getting really high, so I am pruning out the Plazcrete uh, factories that I have and just replacing them with other stuff. In some cases, just wholesale markets, right? I don't have anything good to put there, but a wholesale market at least doesn't cost money and makes a little bit, and Plazcrete costs me money if I'm not using it, right? So we are transitioning into a more, a more money, greedy-based economy and making good cash doing it. Getting antsy, I would really like to go fight, but we're still we're still low on the manpower, right? These guys over here are waiting, and because my money's getting good now, I opt for some champions. We make a knight champion, and we make a musket champion. And, uh, spoilers for you, they survive the entire game. At no point do any of my champions die, which is uh, a blessing and a curse. <laughs> we'll talk about it when we get there. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I want to put in my middle region here. Obviously, I want to keep my Chome branch, but uh, I don't really want the two yellow, uh, two yellow economy, but uh, the two yellow district bonus. I end up putting a blue in there for the extra 200 uh, influence limit, because we're gonna try and we're gonna try and aim for some political offices in the relative short term here. But we are going through to make sure all of our spice harvesters are good to go. Make sure everybody's on safe mode so no worms eat any of this precious manpower from me. Uh, as you probably know, there there is definitely still a recurring bug of, wor or of your harvesters just kind of falling off of safe mode and or just getting eaten while they're on safe mode. It also suddenly occurs to me that I haven't picked out my armory bonuses, right? It's been a nice peaceful game. Hardly a shot fired in anger. So, uh... We go back through here and we add stuff to our guys. Though I could see there that I actually miss, messed up and didn't put both on my musketeer. Hmm. Maybe that's maybe that's the, the, my critical yeah, error my here. But uh, we are just about to cap out our army. 65 of 65. We've gone three knights, five squires, five musketeers, yeah, and two war banners led by Whitmore Blood. Why does that comp make sense? Well, 
we like a bunch of squires. They uh, synergize really well with knights, right? Because they're in the front lines adding extra armor and maybe soaking up hits that would otherwise be hitting our knights. We've gone with the uh, we've gone with the armory upgrade that makes our knights hit at basically double strength, but it costs like a, they cost a bunch more CP to maintain. So uh, our knights are super hard hitting, but we can't afford to have a lot in the army. So we've only got three knights with us. Um, two war banners is nice. We don't need a whole lot out of them. We just want them buffing the army. And if there was only one where we'd be afraid he could get sniped out and then the whole army loses out that buff. And then we just got musketeers because musketeers are great. So it's just sort of a nice balanced comp. Um, it wor it'll, it'll work just pretty well against just about everybody, and it fits really nicely and cleanly within that 65 CP. So we do opt to grab this back region back here. This is a nice money region, right? It's got those rare minerals. Uh, you can see we uh, we finally got a good a good spice rate. We, our chome branch kicked in. We're getting 3.8, and we turn on the selling. We're up to 1.3 thousand solari a day. We are making the money. We have gotten our our blue tech to to give us an extra agent on counterintelligence. So we shift over to three people on counterintelligence just to make sure we're keeping ourselves safe safe from assassins. Uh, we complete this little quest, which gives us an additional 0.3 to our chome rate for a little while. So we are up to 1.4 thousand solari a day, and we are buying chome shares. We're going to stop selling our spice and go back to selling influence for guild favor. And I am getting antsy. I got an army. I got manpower. I got money. I want to do something with it. And I probably shouldn't have <laughs> in retrospect. But uh, I can't help myself, right? I'm an entertainer. I want I want to give the people something to watch. It does, it's no good sitting back and sure I could be buying show them shares and I could buy them a lot faster than everyone else can. Sure I could be securing political offices um, and I can do it a lot more a lot more easily than anyone else in the lobby can. But that's kind of boring. What a passive play style. Passive ain't my style, right? We need we 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 need to get out there and with the flourish with our knights. We need to carry those pink banners high. So we are looking at the political offices. We are gonna try and snag ourselves the eye of the council. We went in there. We upvoted that charter. We're gonna get ready to uh, snag our first office there. And the first one's really all we need, because after we grab that first one, it's gonna open up our uh, eligibility for the governor, which we will have in our pocket ready to go. So I'm not quite ready to commit to, uh, to, to war with the Harkonnens yet. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna go on a little parade and we're gonna, um, do the military parade options in our sanctuaries, I think. Unless we did that already, we'll see. I'm just looking around, keeping an eye on things, keeping an eye on the map. The 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 land that I want to take from the Harkonnens down there actually has a pillage time rot, so I can't do anything. So you can see one of the things you get in the new reworked sanctuaries is you could either tax them for a little bit of money, or you could do a military parade in them, which means everybody that is in that taking part in that siege gets 20 extra experience points, and it also pays you out 20 influence, right? That's a super cool one. I like that a lot. The taxing them only pays you like 300 solari, which is no big deal, but free influence and free money is pretty valuable. So we've got our Eye of the Council up, and though people have saved up some influence here, I've got my triple blue district in play as well, and I have more that I can, more more votes that I could throw around than anyone else wants. And also, I'm fortunate that the chum contracts come up that someone else wants. Doghead even puts a bounty on himself to get Eye of the Council, which is a risky play, but I beat him to it. No one takes his bait. He's the only one who votes for himself. The Harkonnens vote for themselves, for chum shares. The Fremen just abstain. So I get a nice, easy Council position, and it's a good one. We like the two extra agents for free are really handy to have. Extra extra lands red, extra chome. And we are buying. We're sitting on a 12k yes, bank plus 1.5k a day. We We're feeling good. I'm and like lucky. I said, I'm getting that itch. I'm getting that itch to go out and fight somebody. We so we'll get, we're going to continue our military parade, walking into our sanctuaries, doing our little parade, get some XP and some influence on people. 
XP is really important for ECAS armies. Um, when you promote someone to a champion, they gain maximum experience points. They hit the max level, which is, you know, the little chevrons and the star underneath their portrait. So one thing you could do when you're fighting the ECAS is you look for anybody who's max level and you shoot that guy first. Because <laughs> that's probably the champion, and you want to get those champions out of there. But if you've, uh, if you've leveled up your army, right, if you've got other units uh, leveled up to that max level just from fighting, just from military parades, whatever, it suddenly becomes way more difficult to figure out, wait, which guy in this blob of units is the champion? Who am I supposed to be shooting here? It becomes a lot more, a lot more difficult to focus fire the baddies. Um, I've got some extra fuel cells here, so what I opt to do after a little bit of looking around is I'm going to move my, uh, my spacing guild branch to another spot and I'm going to build the uh, experimental furnace up there since, the fur since that region is adjacent to two other spice fields and some decent money making places the experimental furnace uh, is a big economic boost of plus like 20-30% something like that and I'm leaning into the economy boosts here uh, right now I am, I am pulling away from the pack uh, on chome shares and on, on income there's still a lot of squabbling between them down in the south and I am firmly in a popping off territory so I'm, I'm wrecking my administrative hall that's giving me extra authority and I am moving my chome branch over there that was a mistake just with the timing I should have left the chome branch up until the rate changed and I went back to stockpiling, right? So I'm losing a bit of, I'm losing a, a decent chunk of income because I wanted to get that sort of moved over. And I moved it over because I wanted to be able to have two blue in the middle there. Um, two, the double blue option is plus, plus influence plus data. It's a really good one. It's way better than the plus 30 Solari from double yellow. But because I did it too early when we were still in very much of a, a, a selling selling space in the chome market I lost a bit I lost a chunk of uh, my uh, off of my rate there right I'm making 3.5 which is great but I was making 4.3 which is an incredible amount so I, I cost myself some Solari not a not a huge deal it, I don't think that necessarily is what comes back to bite me but uh, I could I could have uh, maximized that a little better so we're keeping an eye on stuff. We're taking a look to make sure we've got everything built out. So you hear the spice rate drops way back down to 2.5, which is no good at all. I should go back to stockpiling. See, now I should have gotten rid of it. And I would have scored an extra few thousand Solari out of it in the meantime if I had done so carefully there. And I am flying my army back and I am getting belligerent. Let's head to the south. So the plan is, um, one, I'm bored and I want to make some stuff happen. So we're going to take this region from the Harkonnens in their backyard. Um, yes, it's going gonna, it's gonna to make them, I think I can get there and probably annex it before they can respond, unless they've got an army that's adjacent to it. Annexing a neutral region is very, very quick. I'm just making sure with my stacked up well, militia that I can get stuff. Adventures. It denies him the ability to come in here and... Uh, grab this or raid this place for for easy pillaging it denies him the ability to come back and grab this place easy for uh for a hedge boom if that's on the menu we carve through the militia in no time at all and his army starts walking we got a we got a worm there which provides us with a little bit of cover he doesn't want to walk in while the worm's there so he's got to pause for a minute and gives us the extra time to stand in there and get this annexin done but he's coming. Oh, Lord, he coming. So we're getting ready. We drop our scav operations. We drop our epic quest. We try to lead with our expendable Landsrad units. And we just start fighting. We just start fighting. And this one goes well for us. Now, we, I talked to uh, Vahutol after the game, right? And he's utilizing a, a super, super strong um, play on the, the, the Harkonnen army that is also uh, quite a bit buggy, right? So the idea is you have a big force of executioners and a big force of Cerberus. Now he just gets dumpstered there. I lose a squire, um, which I am happy to remake, and it's gone way better than expected. And I just killed, 
Oh my god, 20 units there, thanks to the Cerberus split and everything. So it's actually, it's even though I was previously trying to hang back and be very, be very low on the hedge total, my hedge has skyrocketed there. I wasn't even anticipating like a big fight with his army, but he just ran straight in. Look, I hit 20k. I was previously at like 14k. We just got a massive hedge boost. And this catches me off guard. I didn't really want that to happen. I'm not trying to hedge boom here. I am just trying to be a, you know, a little bit of a, a troublemaker. Maybe take some more e economy off the Harkonnens. Maybe keep them busy. I didn't anticipate uh, this hedge boom. And the trouble with it is... I am not planning to hedge boom, but the other lobby sees me, or the every other players in the lobby see me shooting up. So I'm starting to freak out. What am I going to do? So I, I crush my research center back at the base. That gets rid of that 15% uh, retroactive bonus on my territory. So I drop back down under 20k so I don't look quite as threatening. I do not want the rest of the lobby to just dogpile on me um, and and mess me up here. I, I want to I wanna play slow. This is only month six, and I've got such a huge political, such a huge economic lead. I want to be leaning into those things. I don't want to be pushing the, you know, the, the hedge game right away. In retrospect, I probably should have. It, it comes back to bite me here. So we've got uh, the Water Sellers Union up. Doghead is rallying the lobby against me. For the love of God, don't give them water cellars. It doesn't matter at all. Um, I've only got four water, uh, so it wouldn't have been a particular boon to me. I think winning a charter also pays out like a bit of money in standing, something like that. I'm not sure the exact amounts, but I already am at 450 standing, which is all the standing I need. If you look at the top, I'm already eligible for governorship. All I need to do is upvote that and then have more authority than everybody. So Doghead manages to steal the Water Cellars Union, yes, and um, yes, the Harkonnens are prepping for round two over hunt. here, we got because we have gone this. over, oh, you get back there, because we have gone over and we have stolen one of their spice fields, and I am just cackling internally here, oh my god, am I going to have six spice fields to play with? How long am I able to hold six spice fields? At your um, I actually end up with an administrative burden on You're my starting. main base, I think it just fell off there, but... Uh, the theme of the rest of the game is that I'm going to be administrative burdened basically forever. Uh, the, the Harkonnens start spamming it out on me, and then the smugglers join in. And between the two of them, I am just eternally administrative burdened. Um, which causes a lot of problems. It is both preventing me from building the buildings I want in my base. I'm still trying to get a last district or two up in it. And it's going to prevent me from, from making units to replenish my army as well. It's a really strong move. You can see Dirty Dan says, send peace, Hark, right, White? So the Fremen are making peace with the Harkonnens because they are all about to come jump on me. They are scheming in the shadows. They realize that Ekaz have come out of their shell and they're coming to cause problems. And unfortunately, I haven't quite accepted that reality myself. I'm, you know... I'm not trying to hedge boom, I'm not trying to, to charge away to victory here, and I, I, I honestly, I don't uh, yet understand the, I don't yet understand the threat, I don't, I don't see everyone coming for me right now, because, because like I said, I wasn't trying to boom. So I'm keeping an eye out, and we got the Harkonnens coming in here again, so I figure, okay, let's get ready, we, we, we set up our formation, we move our Landsrad to the front, we move our Musketeers to the back. We move our, we try to keep our knights in the middle, and we, ideally we would have liked our squires in the front. And once again, we engage with the Harkonnens. So back to the Harkonnen plan. The idea of it is their Cerberus units die, and they give buffs to the executioners, but they also have the armory upgrade that say the executioners get, um, like meat armor or meat stacks or something. So it's like, if they have stacks from units dying around them, they, uh, when they would die, they instead get healed 50 hit points, making them much, much harder to kill. But apparently that's kind of buggy, so sometimes it procs properly, or sometimes you don't get the proper stacks. And, um, regardless of what happens, we have lost, uh, a single other squire here, and we wreck them and pull out, <laughs> pull out 3,000 more hegemony when we don't really want it. So I'm starting to say, oh, okay, I guess, um, I guess it's a thing now. 
I, I, I am forced into a hedge boom when I didn't want to be. So I'm sort of starting to freak out. We've got uh, we've got Fremen in the back lines I've got to try and deal with. I know the Fremen are a tough army to fight. They've got a lot of armor piercing, and the ECAS rely heavily on armor piercing. So I don't even know that this is how well this one's going to go up here. There is still the admin burden on my base. I can, I'm not yet able to replace losses, so I'm not at a full stack army. I'm about 8 CP lower than a full stack at this point. But we can't just leave these dirty Fremen in our back lands. Um, we're gonna go into them. So we do, we drop the stuff. We actually, the chome rates are super low. We're making still pretty great money even though the rates are awful, the trade rates are awful. So we turn on the auto buy. Um, Cause I'm trying to get up to the 30% for the extra strength bonus. And you can see this one is a bit more of a mixed bag. We've already lost eight CP of guys and we've got a worm coming in which is extremely dangerous for the ECAS. One of the worst things that can happen to the ECAS army is getting worm struck because your guys take so long to train, they're more expensive, they're such an investment and we do at least get one musketeer gets eaten by that worm. But otherwise we tear these Fremen apart and we have harvested another two and a half thousand hedge from them. And this is probably my biggest mistake. I should have been full-on boom mode here. Um, so my guys are kind of stuck there because there's a worm around, so I can't go anywhere. So I do come back and I do build my research center. I'm trying to think of what I'm going to do. Uh, what I needed to do was split my army. I should have grabbed the sanctuary south of me. I should have grabbed the sanctuary north of me and even maybe the one right next to my base. I should have just annexed all of my sanctuaries that I possibly had the authority to. But I'm still not... I'm not quite in that like I need to I need to boom hedge as much as possible because I know I can't contest this smuggler army at this point in time, right? Uh, my I'm I'm down 8 I'm down 11 CP. No, even more cuz a knight died. So he's like 7. So it was 11. Uh, yeah, I'm down like 14 CP off of a main army. So I don't have a huge stack. Um I need to I need to get my guys healed up, but I opt to go back and fight the Harkonnens. Uh, one because I've been kicking them around so badly, I figured maybe I might be able to get a good favorable trade even when my army is down. But uh, we're, it's, we're starting to get pressed a little thin here, and you can watch in this one the Harkonnens do a lot better. So they actually um, they actually had uh, an opportunity to fight the militia and to get all their guys on top of each other, which I think gave them better procs on their stacks of meat on their executioners. You can see their executioners here just are not dying. They're down to zero hit points and every time I try to kill them they gain more. I'm focus firing everybody on top of them and every time they gain more. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a tough one so we, we take some casualties. So it's a, it's a tough drag out fight here. We are we are burning through them as best we can, but we've taken a lot of casualties, and we are once again administrative burdened, meaning it's going to be a long, long time before any reinforcements come. I am back on the auto buy. Doghead says you gotta focus as champions. No one's killed a champion yet. All of my champions are alive. In fact, nobody but my champions are alive. Whitmore, that knight, that musketeer, those are my three champions. They have lived through every battle, and I am at 27.3k hedge. Every non-champion unit has died, but the champions have all survived. That's almost, it's almost a curse at this point, because I know that without an army, I can't contest anything else. I can't defend myself, but it still looks like I'm about to win the game any second now. Um, so... This is another mistake that I'm making. I really ought to have, like I said, I, I should have just pushed for it because I've got, we've won, oh my God, we've won four full battles, basically, four full army wipes with these three champions. I think these guys have like, somewhere between like 12 and 16,000 hegemony on them at this point, right? I've got, I've got very low hedge on my land. Um, I've got good votes here, um, but they're talking about taking Judge of the Council, so I don't try for that. I try just to get the lands red witnesses out, so I've got some extra military to work with, right? Um, since I'm admin burdened, I'm not likely to be able to recreate anything. I can see the Harkonnens are massing on my border over there again, and my they had chopped up the airfield down there. So we just start booking it back to the nearest airfield on foot before the Harkonnens come. 
Um, we, yeah, I, 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 this is probably my opportunity right in this range where I think I could have won if my research center had been finished, which it probably never would. Um, it probably never would finish because uh, the the ad admin burden is keeping my buildings also creating 80% slower. So I start to sort of walk up. I don't know what I'm thinking here. I start walking up with the Landsrad to annex that, but then I see the smugglers over there and I'm worried they're going to contest it. So I back off and I cancel my research center. One, because I'm frustrated that it's never getting built. It's like 30 more days of build time on it. And I don't... I, 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 my, so my, my thought process is here, when the research center actually gets built, I'm going to have already lost like eight territories. So I don't, I don't, I'm not pushing for the, the, the hegemony. Um, in retrospect, I definitely should have left it up because even losing all of my territory to people decapping all my stuff, all of my hedge at this point is on my three champions who refuse to die. And they are absolute raid bosses at this point. Remember that uh, Whitmore Blood buffs them up the more trophies they have. And I don't, I don't know if I ever actually click on them and look at them. So I'm thinking about it, I'm kind of regretful. Uh, should I have built that research center? And so I, I opt to go back to an intelligence center and I try to sort of talk people off me. Okay, you know, all of my land is being liberated. Leave me alone. And again, I guess not quite realizing that all of my hedge is on my champions. So even when they liberate all my land, I still look like I'm about to win the game at any second. Uh, and I, I should have pushed for it, right? If I had taken that top sandfall region, that would have been... 1300, no, 1600, which would have put me at 28.6. If I had taken the southern region, it would have been another 600, which would have been 29.2. And then I just would have needed, if I could have taken a third region, it would have been incredibly close, but I would have needed to farm up some more hedge yeah, with champions. And I don't dodges. think that I can do that. I don't have any, we're still like 15 days away from a spice tax. I don't have any army that could fight, right? I've, I'm still under an admin burden. I think only just now the admin burden starts to fall. Nope, there's another one back up on me. I'm still under admin burden, so I can't make any new army. I can't, I can't even fight with my champions for hedge. Cause, so I, I can't do a whole lot other than sit here and take whatever the beatings on me are. Though, that's my thought process at the moment. In retrospect, I see that, uh, you know, the Fremen are getting spread a little thin and they are running out of supplies in their own little liberation campaign back there. I'm eyeballing the smugglers and I want them to go away, but I can't do anything about them. They have a fully sauced up army with the wraith up there. I am just at the mercy of them. Oh yeah, I did mouse over that. I'm at 12k hegemony from champions right now. Though, still under admin burden, so stuff is coming out. Once a month, I get a new guy to fight with. Doghead realizes I also have 30% chom at this point, so my guys are... Uh, uh, <laughs> dirty dances, nice spawn, Dave. Uh, yeah, so we uh, we are pushing we are pushing all the all the fronts. I tell everyone to go home. I'm a paper tiger. I've only got uh, hedge on champs, but the 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 plotting or the the politicking here is futile. Uh, I should have I should have just leaned into it, right? I was hoping that I that other people would look dangerous and folks would be forced to sort of back off and deal with them. So I see, oh look, those uh, those Fremen are over there. They're running low on water. They're getting overextended. They're trying to take a lot of stuff. I don't know if they're going to get it. And I've got I don't know eight eight or nine guys up, three of which are ungodly raid bosses. So I come over here and boom, I am going to clear out. At least, so one guy, so there's 400 champion, or 400 hedge, that guy dies, I come over, that guy runs away over there, so I only get 400 hedge out of it, but, um, you know, I, I, could, I could have stepped up and, and, and at least annexed my sanctuaries, and I don't, because I really, really want people to lay off of me. I don't feel like this is the end game scenario. We're in month seven, folks, that is a pretty early game still, but, uh. I didn't take my own advice and I didn't push my tempo when I had it, right? But I'm also, I'm, I'm stuck with no, no army that can fight anymore. After that, after that real tough trade, the, the, the third fight against the Harkonnens in which the Harkonnens were wiped out, we lost a lot of brave ECAS warriors and we haven't been able to remake them since because we've been under just a perpetual admin burden. 
Regardless, I I should have I should definitely have been taken my sanctuaries. Um, it, like I said, my my thoughts here are that I can maybe hang low. Smugglers are climbing up, and maybe we could get a little aggro over on the smugglers. Dirty Dan says nope. It's still Ekaz. Doghead says nope. We still gotta kill Ekaz, right? So my my politicking, my trying to feel weak uh, was no good, and I kept half expecting that a champion would die in the fights that I'm in. Alright, you know, someone's gonna kill at least one of these champions and I'm gonna drop way back down below the radar. But the champions keep living, right? They're, they just keep taking trophies and um, just sending that hedge to the moon. My empire is in shambles. I'm at like one, two, three, four. I'm at like f six or seven regions here. But I'm still by far the highest on hedge. So I'm trying to tell people that the smugglers are villains, but... I should have just leaned into villainous, villainy myself, right? Uh, making an, an intel agency, it doesn't make me happy. I wish it was a research center at this point, probably, since everyone is still just agreeing to come fight me. Um, grabbing points of interest. But I do have one more plan in my back pocket. So I see I see uh, Doghead fly away with the smuggler, so I, I'm trying to see if maybe I can go ahead and take that, that western region. Maybe if he's busy, maybe if someone is on him, I could go mess it up. But the Wraith is still out there, and I do not have a, a maxed out army, and I certainly don't want to fight under a Wraith if he ends up coming back. But looky, looky here, we've got ourselves a governorship, and no way anyone can contest us, right? We've got 200 votes, we've got 700 authority. It is an easy governorship. Furthermore, the architectural surveys is up, and we can just opt out of it via the power of Ebo Vip making us immune to that resolution. So, the, glor the, the great benefit of House Ekaz, uh, if you win governorship, and you've got the perfected politics, they cannot upvote the governorship to come up again. If you've got Ebo Vip and you can opt out of Landsrad resolutions, they cannot remove things from you with loss of rights. So a governorship is a guaranteed win in 30 days. I just kind of throw stuff on other people after that, but uh, I'm pretty comfortable. If, if they pooled all of their votes, they don't have enough. They don't have enough to stop me, so I am the governor here and I need to figure out how to live for 30 days. We're, we're, we're finally off of uh, an admin burden, so we're actually getting up to a, a fully stacked up army here. And the Harkonnens are very close by. They are already coming in. Doghead is already flying back up, so they are close by. Ooh, it's gonna be tough. It's gonna be a tight one. We gotta, we gotta fight the Harkonnens. We don't wanna fight both of them together. Um, I'm thinking at this point that I do when Dirty Dan gets eaten bad by a worm, I think, so he doesn't even get to contribute to, to this final base rush. So my thought here is we I get them to come in underneath. I'm throwing up some, some emergency turrets in the neighboring bases. My thought is I get them to come, on, come in underneath the, uh, the base, the base rockets, and let the base do a little bit of tanking while my army hopefully can uh, do a little bit of chopping. Now again, I might if I had had my research center up here and I'd had those other lands um, annexed, I might have just won on hedge right here because they opt to go straight for the base. Now it is a sad situation. The smugglers, of course, have done their underworld headquarters to remove a bunch of the armor. The Harkonnens have done a defensive breach, so my base is dropping fast. And even though they make what I would have considered a strong mistake by not fighting my army. Uh, the Harkonnen um, meat stacks are working just fine, and I just cannot kill these executioners. I cut through their army when the executioners just don't die. We managed to pull down the wraith. I should have shifted over. Maybe I should have started on the smugglers, because I would have burned through them real fast. They don't go invulnerable. But it's just too much. And even though I'm going to clear out the Harkonnens easy, I would have been able to clear out the smugglers easy. It's too much DPS. That was one of the fastest base kills I've seen, thanks to defense breaches, uh, a, a sauced up smuggler army, and those uh, hidden explosives, thanks to the Underworld headquarters. And what can I say? They got me. They got me, boys. It was it was a good one, though. We were pushing the hedge. We took the governorship. We were pushing the chomes. We were the triple threat there. It was a lot of fun. I had a really great time with it. I, I might have been able to pull it out if I had grabbed those sanctuaries and had gotten that research center up, but 
I'm not totally convinced on that either. I don't know that the research center ever would have completed since I was pretty much perma, perma admi, administrative burdened there. And um, uh, yeah, it's a crazy game, man. It would have been close, but uh, I, I, sh- I should have leaned into my villainy instead of trying to, to play weak. No one, no one sees me and thinks that I'm going to be weak. Oh, well, it's, it's the, you know, the eternal curse. So like I said, believe it or not, that was me trying to play a game, hang a back under the radar. A lot of good that did for me. Ha, 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 ha.